All right, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite our president, Father Peter Donahue, who will say uh, a few words of welcome to all of you. Thank you. Now, before I read what was officially prepared for me, I just want to say to the students, you know, this is a great opportunity for you. We have these talks all the time, and you'll hear somebody talk for several minutes, maybe many minutes. But really, the best part of the conversation is after the person has finished speaking. Because then, actually, people have to ask him or her questions and um, puts them on the spot, so to speak, and says, OK, now respond to this in one way or another. So all of those reports you have to do for class, the really fascinating part for the faculty member will be that you stayed for the questions. <laughs> I had better not see you leaving. OK. Um, I, uh, Sue Toten, uh, many of you may know Sue Toten, has actually uh, prepared a whole uh, array of things to say here. Usually I talk off the cuff but I got this message from her that you are to read this two to three minute speech. And uh, where is she? Oh, there she is back there. <laughs> you are to read and you are to stay on script. So I'm, I'm gonna go off script for a minute here and so, uh, because I read through all of it and I am very happy that Ken Hackett is here tonight because Ken Hackett is an honorary Villanovan. So uh, several. A couple of years ago, Villanova had the great privilege of having Ken as our graduation speaker, and we awarded him with an honorary doctorate. So um, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Ken Hackett to Villanova. On behalf of Villanova University, now I'm going to read Sue's text here, OK? <laughs> On behalf of Villanova University, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Ken Hackett, Dr. Ken Hackett. Uh, President of Catholic Relief Services, our guest from Catholic Relief Services, the community, and to our faculty and our students. This evening's lecture by Ken Hackett with additional remarks, remarks on Haiti's water challenge by Dennis Warner is the concluding session of today's day-long symposium on the global water crisis, conflict, and collaboration. The symposium was a collaborative effort between Catholic Relief Services and Villanova University. Catholic Relief Services is the official overseas humanitarian agency of the United States Catholic community. It alleviates suffering and provides assistance to people in need in more than 100 countries without regard to race, religion, or nationality. In 2005, Villanova University, together with four other Catholic higher education institutions, entered into a formal partnership with Catholic Relief Services for the purposes of deepening our institutional's respective and shared mission to reduce human misery and promote justice, peace, and global solidarity through collaborating in global education, research, advocacy and service. Today's symposium on the global water crisis is just one of the many examples of this collaboration over the past five years. I want to particularly thank Sue Toten for her efforts and her energy, I'm going off script again, uh, uh, for her efforts and energy in um, really establishing this collaboration with CRS. It has been a wonderful collaboration. We have grown from it, and I hope that CRS has grown from it as well. But um, for Villanova, the CRS connection has been um, a, a real monumental move forward for us in the, in the world of justice and peace and serving the needs of others and to really contributing to the common good. Um, Sue, thank you. <laughs> Now it is my pleasure to bring back Dr. Barbara Wall.
Um, I too have a script. Did you take my script? No, I only took my page. Well, no, I had it here. <laughs> Sue. <laughs> Does anyone have the script that she wrote? <laughs> Where did she go? I left it right here. I too had a prescribed script. So, no. Where is she? She's back there laughing. <laughs> I had it right here with my glasses on top. You saw it. <laughs> well, at any rate, excuse me. Well, that's Ken's talk. I, he doesn't want me to read his talk. <laughs> no. Where is Dennis Warner? Did you do you have an extra piece of paper there? Or several pieces of paper. Did you pick anything up from here? Just wing it. There were, there were several pages here, so be patient. There's winging it, and then there's winging it. Okay. <laughs> that looks like it. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Okay. This is my script. You all ready? Before introducing Ken Hackett and Dennis Warner, I would like to take a few minutes to thank those who have so generously contributed to today's symposium. It wasn't only Sue Toten, although she did the most uh, Herculean part of the task, but they include the College of Engineering, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the College of Nursing, the School of Business, the School of Law, the Office of and Vice President for Academic Affairs, the Office of Mission and Ministry, the Center for Peace and Justice Education, the Honors Program, the Global Interdisciplinary Studies Program, the Department of Geography and the Environment, and the Cultural Studies major. These are our supporters. <laughs> Special thanks are due to the faculty from across the university, the CRS expert staff, and the representatives from industry who served as presenters and respondents in today's symposia. Sincere thanks are also due to Arlene Flaherty, CRS Northeast Office Justice and Peace Partnership Liaison. There she is. <laughs> Maureen McCullough, CRS Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Regional Director. Beth Hassel, Director of the Center for Faith and Learning. She's here. <laughs> Kristen Russell, Louise Griffin, and Tony Alfano. We're most grateful for the help and support of all these people. Now to introducing our guest speakers, Ken Hackett, President of CRS, and Dr. Dennis Warner, CRS Senior Technical Advisor for Water Supply, Sanitation, and Water Resources Development. Mr. Hackett will speak for approximately 30 minutes on Haiti, Let's Get It Right, and Dr. Warner will speak for approximately 15 minutes on Haiti's Water Challenge. This will leave approximately 20 minutes for Q&A, and we will leave the questions until after the two presentations. Um, Ken Hackett is president, as you've heard, um, of Catholic Relief Services, one of the world's most effective and efficient relief and development agencies. He oversees operations in more than 100 countries with a global staff of nearly 5,000. Mr. Hackett is a native of West Roxbury, Mass. After graduating from Boston College in 1968, he joined the Peace Corps and was assigned to serve in Ghana. Mr. Hackett joined CRS in 1972, starting his career in Sierra Leone. He has served CRS in posts throughout Africa and Asia, as well as in a variety of positions at CRS headquarters. He was the regional director for Africa, guiding CRS's response to the Ethiopian famine of 1984-85. to 85. He supervised operations in East Africa during the crisis in Somalia, 
in the early 1990s. Mr. Hackett has led CRS since 1993. During Mr. Hackett's tenure, CRS has embarked on a concerted effort to engage the U.S. Catholic community in its work around the world. As part of this strategy, CRS established the U.S. Operations Division in 2002 with a mission to foster global solidarity among U.S. Catholics. In addition, lay people were appointed for the first time to the CRS Board of Directors. Mr. Hackett has received honorary degrees from Boston College, Cabrini College, College of Great Falls, College of Notre Dame of Maryland, New York Medical College, Siena College, University of Notre Dame, University of San Diego, and Villanova University. In 2004, Mr. Hackett was named a Knight Commander of the Papal Order of St. Gregory the Great, one of the highest papal honors. He has served as North America President of Caritas Internacionales, the Confederation of Humanitarian Agencies of the Global Catholic Church. He is currently a member of the boards of the Pontifical Commission Cor Unum, the Vatican body that coordinates the Church's charitable work. Migration and Refugee Services, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, International Policy Committee, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Africa Society. He has served on the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs and was recently named to Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley's International Advisory Council. Since 2004, Mr. Hackett has served on the Board of Directors of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, a federal effort to increase aid to countries that demonstrate the commitment to ruling justly, investing in people, and encouraging economic freedom. Mr. Hackett lives in Baltimore with his wife and two children. They are parishioners at the Cathedral of Mary, our Queen. We're delighted to have you with us again. A few words on Dennis Warner, who is a senior technical advisor for water supply, sanitation, and water resources development with Catholic Relief Services. He has over 40 years' experience in international development, working on problems of water supply, sanitation, environmental health, and emergency relief assistance. Raised in the Chicago area, he studied history and engineering at the University of Illinois, where he earned a BA, Bachelor of Science, and Master of Science degrees, and at Stanford University, where he obtained a PhD in civil engineering. Dr. Warner has lived in Tanzania, Uganda, Switzerland, and France, and has held positions with the Peace Corps, University of Dar es Salaam, Duke University, World Health Organization, World Bank, USAID, and several engineering consulting firms. Dr. Warner represents CRS on the board of Millennium Water Alliance and serves on its executive committee. In 2000, he served as representative Pax Christi International to the United Nations in Geneva. I'm going to go off script just for a few, for one minute, and say, I think it's, it's just extraordinary for all of us to be able to see the kind of people that have invested their lives in the poor of the world. This is, this is instructional in itself. Apart from what they say, it's also who they are and what they've become as people. So tonight's focus is on Haiti. Let's get it right with Ken Hackett, President of Catholic Relief Services, and Dennis Warner on Haiti's Water Challenge. Please give them both a very warm Villanova welcome. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's, it's really um, a great honor to be back here. Uh, the commencement that I did a couple of years ago was, well, as you, as you note, I've gotten a few honorary degrees from a few uh, universities, in fact, 13. So now I measure them about which one is organized better and which one has the most fun. And you were up at the top of the scale for the most fun in your commencement exercise. I'll tell you that. Thank you very much for, for having us here. Um, I should begin by 
disabusing you of uh, some ideas that maybe many of you had coming here today. If you expected an uplifting, inspirational talk about the great work of Catholic Relief Services and what we're doing in Haiti, uh, like some motivational uh, speaker, you're going to be disappointed. Haiti doesn't lend itself to that. Haiti's a tough one. I have seen and participated in many, many um, major emergencies around the world through my entire professional life. And I can tell you that what happened with this earthquake is like no other disaster I have ever experienced. And like Dennis, we go back 40 years. That's a long time. The immensity of the destruction, the many, many needs of the people on so many levels the total absence of a strong functioning government, the extent of the displacement and the difficulties of coordination among those who were and still are responding, they're all part of this complex of factors that make Haiti really difficult. And it's gotten even worse in the last few days. Some of you have uh, who have time have watched CNN and seen the storm coming in. It hit Haiti. Didn't hit as bad as everybody expected. But it dropped five inches of rain on most of the country. And that has added to the misery. And I read a report this morning on my BlackBerry coming up from Baltimore. The cholera levels are now at 554 dead. And it's creeping on to Port-au-Prince cholera, the first time in 50 years that this island has experienced it. And add to that fact that before the earthquake in Haiti, it was one of the poorest countries in the world, certainly the poorest in our hemisphere. And with all of that, you begin to get an idea what groups like Catholic Relief Services face in our response in Haiti. So when we talk about getting it right in Haiti, we're not talking about spending a few years cleaning the place up and leaving behind a prosperous, developed country with everyone nicely housed and fully employed and well-fed and, he and healthy. That ain't it. That's not going to happen. Haiti was a poor country before the earthquake. It will continue to be a poor country after the earthquake and in the years ahead. It will continue to be a poor country after all the relief is finished. That negative tone conveyed, there are still many, many opportunities for good here. For one thing, there was, as you know, an out, unprecedented outpouring of generosity. At Catholic Relief Services, to date, we have raised in private contributions from individuals $149 million. I don't know what your operating budget per year here is, but $149 million should go a long way. It's a lot of money. But it's only a fraction of what has been raised throughout the entire international community. Just in the United States alone from the Red Cross, which is the largest fundraising private organization, they raised about $400 million. We came next with about $150 million. And overall, if you put all the private agencies together, the CARES, the Save the Children, the Christian Children's Fund, it's about $1.3 billion. Now with $1.3 billion, you would think all those American agencies should be able to do something really profound in that country. And we hope we can. And then you add to that all of the government money that has been pledged much of it not delivered, but pledged nonetheless. And there's a lot of money that is available for Haiti. And that kind of money is obviously important. But even more important is that we have an opportunity at this point in time to rethink how Haiti will be redeveloped. You were talking about short-term solutions a few minutes ago. 
If the international community can come together and come up with a new paradigm for how it provides assistance and engages Haitians in new ways, new things can be done. We run a tremendous risk that unless we all come together in ways like we've never done before, at the end of the day, all we may be able to say is that we've carried out many good acts of charity and some buildings were built. Yet Haiti will remain as broken a society as it was before the earthquake. And even more Haitians will continue to live in soul-grinding poverty. Why do I say that? Over the last three decades, when faced with problems in Haiti, as an international community, our solutions have too often been to do it, to fix it, to run it. There are thousands of fragmented individual initiatives, hundreds of humanitarian groups, religious organizations, individual parishes, and even individuals active in Haiti. And while this fragmentation of effort has led to an improvement in the lives of many individuals, it has also promoted a mentality among Haitians of passivity and reliance on foreign solutions and resources. And at the same time, it has also undermined the responsibility of the nation as a whole, both of its government and of its other civil institutions. That's what has to change if we're going to get it right. And that's a tall order in this country. I think we should probably spend a few minutes contemplating some of the complexities of responding to the earthquake. Every disaster has its share of second guessing and Haiti was no exception. In fact, within two days, the media was already criticizing the relief effort. Why weren't we doing more? Why weren't we faster? People were dying needlessly. The fact is that given the destroyed port, the barely functioning airports, roads that were totally clogged with rubble, you couldn't get through most of Port-au-Prince in those early days, and not to mention the, the immensity of the destruction, the deaths, and the injuries, the trauma, the pain. Actually, the relief effort, the relief effort was quite amazing. Within days, hundreds of thousands of people were getting food. A lot of it came from Catholic Relief Services, as we already had our stocks in Haiti prepositioned. Though there were complaints about bottlenecks at the airport, a huge amount of supplies was moved very, very quickly. I met a professor here tonight whose son was flying Blackhawks. The U.S. military did marvelous things in logistics in the first month in Haiti. Marvelous things. The problem was not the emergency response. The problem was the overall scale of the disaster. You organize a feeding program for tens of thousands of people, and you do it in a couple of days, and you say to yourself, whew, that was a big undertaking. And you turn around twice, and there's a million and a half people who haven't got food. It was an immense challenge. There's another factor here that cannot be ignored. We like our aid for people suffering from disasters to kind of look a certain way. You know, um, let me give you an example. Within a few weeks of the earthquake, it became clear that there was actually food in the markets in Port-au-Prince. The ladies were selling food in Delmas, which is one area of town where our office is, all along the road. People were walking food in from the countryside. And what was the most important thing? To make sure that the markets start to work and the economy starts to pick up. Not 
to continue to give people free food forever. But to try to get the media to cover a cash for work program where people get paid, for instance, to remove the rubble, and then they have some cash in their hand, and she can go to the market and buy some grain and some fruit and some vegetables and a piece of chicken for her, her family, media doesn't like that kind of stuff. They want to see the distribution of bags of food with USA written on the side of it, and that goes on Anderson Cooper 360 or whoever else was down there. That's the picture that, that they wanted. I'll give you another example. Right after the earthquake, all sorts of doctors and medical personnel rushed to Haiti. They were needed. At CRS, we worked uh, to get a makeshift hospital going in the destroyed ruins of um, a hospital right downtown in Port-au-Prince. It was called St. Francis de Sales. It's a, it's a very old hospital. Um, we had been working on an antiretroviral program with AIDS victims out of that hospital. The hospital collapsed. Ninety people were killed in the hospital, mostly women and children in the pediatric ward. And we tried to get it up and running, and, and we started. We actually didn't even have any tents. We just operated outside under the trees. And we had a variety of doctors from all over the world who would show up at the front door of the hospital and say, in some language, most times we couldn't understand it, either Polish or Czech or uh, something, can we offer? And, and they came in and they set up. And then one of our ongoing partners, the University of Maryland, started sending down rotations of teams from their shock trauma unit. These were teams of nurses and physicians who know how to function as a team. And they were tremendously effective. But you had all these other doctors that were just running around doing things. And we found after week five, the University of Maryland shock trauma people were having to redo the operations done by some of these other doctors and, and groups because it was so haphazard. You remember the pictures probably of um, the teams arriving on the U.S. naval ship, the Comfort. And to give you an example of unintended consequences, the story of the Comfort is a good illustration of one of the problems uh, with many people's ideas about medical assistance. I think in the minds of a lot of Americans, that ship was like the Calvary, rushing in to save people. I mean, that's the way I felt. It comes out of Baltimore. I said, geez, that's great. The ship is going to take care of all these people. But within a couple of weeks, its 400 beds were full. Again, due to the scope of the disaster. And then uh, as the Navy doctors took care of the broken bones and other problems uh, that came with the quake, they found that all the beds were full. Not necessarily with quake victims, but with poor people who had chronic illnesses and have had them for a long time. And then the Navy was really stuck. What are we going to do? The comfort is going to have to be here forever because there's a lot of people that need a lot of assistance. And the question became for the Navy, how do you extricate the comfort after all the media had covered it? After Sanjay Gupta had covered it. How do you pull it out without people saying you're abandoning us? A challenge. Of course, the medical response got huge coverage in the media. It's, it's great stuff uh, for the media. Doctors coming in and giving free, quote, top of the line service to the people of this poor country. Who could have a problem with any of that? Well, one group who had a problem with some of it were the Haitian doctors. Haiti didn't have much of a health system prior to the earthquake, but it did have a health system. It had nurses and doctors who tried their best, whatever that best was. 
And with all these foreign doctors and nurses arriving, offering free medical care, they totally displaced the entire Haitian medical system. All those doctors who counted on some remuneration from Haitian patients could get nothing now. There was no money flowing in the Haitian health system. So the un unintended results of this popular act of charity could be to leave behind a destroyed Haitian health system. Not a good thing. What was going to happen when all those first world doctors went home? Which inevitably they did. I want to mention one other aspect of the response that got a great deal of publicity. The rescue teams. Remember those teams from the fire department somewhere out here in, in, in Pennsylvania that rushed down and did, did great stuff and, and I in no way want to diminish or disparage the, the courageous work uh, that the rescue teams did. Could be some people here who participated in that. But I want to put it in perspective. The statistics show that the entire group of rescue teams rescued 132 people. Out of the 230 people that died, 132 lives, sacred lives, were kept alive by those rescue teams. But 132 out of 230,000? You know, if we had been more efficient in bringing in antibiotics, we could have kept tens of thousands of people alive. If the energy and cost that went into the rescue teams and flying down their vehicles on C-130s and, and all their staff and their dogs and things like that, which was, it was good stuff. If some of it had gone into the supply of antibiotics in those early days, many more thousands of people would be alive. Should we have brought in more antibiotics? and fewer rescue teams? I don't know, but it's a legitimate question. But clearly, the work of the rescue teams got tremendous coverage on TV, out of proportion to their actual impact on the casualties. Why was that? Obviously, it's very dramatic to watch them work in saving a life, much more dramatic than giving somebody antibiotics or an IV drip. But there's another reason this work has such appeal. It fits into our American conception of the delivery of assistance following a disaster. We in the developed world have the smarts and the technology, and we swoop down from the heavens to rescue the poor, uneducated, helpless victims. The rescue teams were the perfect image of that. Individualized, small, fragmented, often heroic, yet most often time-bound interventions that were done for people, not with them. And quite often, little was left behind that builds any sustainable capacity. And frankly, that's exactly the narrative that we have to get away from if we want Haiti to progress. It's a very popular narrative. It's very effective in the media. I have to admit, it's also very effective in raising money. And certainly after a disaster, people need to be fed and they need to get medical attention. They need to be rescued if trapped in buildings. But once that's happened, the world community has to go further. The Haitian community has to go for further. But in Haiti, for the last 40 years, the international community has not succeeded in doing any of that. One reason that we at Catholic Relief Services feel a particular responsibility for what we're doing in, in Haiti is because we've got a long history there. It's over 50 years, 56 to be exact. And it's also because it's a Catholic country, and so the roots are deep. The church is a very important institution in every city and town and village, 
And we work with the church as partners in so many of our projects. And I think that one reason that Americans were so generous in their outpouring of aid for Haiti, because it's close. It's just there, off our coast. Our histories are intertwined. We all know Haitians personally. From a Catholic perspective, this proximity has resulted in many parishes in the United States adopting parishes in Haiti, sending money and other contributions. And, and that generosity is truly admirable. It's an exhibition of solidarity, and it should be praised. But the problem is that rarely do these adopted parishes grow up and begin to walk on their own and sustain themselves. They remain kind of like adopted preteens. Once the money is spent, probably on good and needed programs, too often the Haitian church, that is the adopted parish, simply goes back to its American adopted parent and asks for more. Such an approach leads to haphazard charity. A parish that has a particularly charismatic priest who's formed good relations with Americans <coughs> might walk away with a lot of money. And that priest who lives in the mountains, who doesn't speak good English, who's a pious, hardworking, wonderful priest <coughs> doing great things for poor people, doesn't get to come to the United States, to the fancy parish out here and wherever is fancy around here. He doesn't make it, so he gets no money. It's haphazard. So this is the type of dilemma we face, the international community faces. It's the type rope that we have to walk as we move forward in Haiti. How do we praise and encourage the generosity that so many people have shown towards Haiti, both throughout the years and in the wake of this earthquake? while fighting against this fragmentation, this individualized approach, and steering the money in new directions so it will be used in a coordinated way and have longer lasting benefits, how do we build sustainable lasting capabilities in Haiti by Haitians? That's what we have to do if we're going to get it right. But how do you do it? I'll throw two models at you. One possible model is the way we're going about issues for the reconstruction of church property. Now, some of you who know a little bit about Catholic Relief Services know that it's not in our mandate to build churches or convents or rectories. That's not what we do. It's not what we were set up for. That belongs in the mandate of another American organization called Propagation of the Faith. But in the Haiti context, Everything was destroyed, not just physically. Churches were destroyed, schools were destroyed, orphanages, rectories, convents, all kinds of buildings, roads, bridges. But people went through a psychological trauma, an emotional trauma. Their families were destroyed. They lost loved ones. And who best to bring some comfort and succor to people who are suffering psychologically and spiritually? Usually it's church workers. And in the Catholic context in Haiti, that often takes place in the physical building of the church. So we realized very quickly that we had to think about how to help the church in Haiti to rebuild some of its structures and its capacities, to get going again. But there's a history. There's a history with the government of Haiti, with the church in Haiti, and with other civil society institutions. The history is fraught with lack of accountability, lack of transparency. The buildings that fell down for those engineering students that are here were not built to code. The one that stayed up were built to code. So nobody was building to code. So how are we going to help rebuild when all of that history exists. So with the French, we tried to come up with an idea 
that would put at the disposal of the Catholic bishops in Haiti a capacity, a capacity of architects and engineers and lawyers and people who know how to build stuff. Set it up as a unit, a company so to speak, make it available to them so that all of the money that's available from around the world, from the French, the Italians, the Germans, the Brits, the Japanese, the Americans, the Canadians, that is going to go to the reconstruction of church property will be channeled through this entity that will guarantee accountability, transparency, and building to code. That's going to be about a two to three hundred million dollar effort over the next ten years. It'll be staffed by Haitians and international advisors and it will ensure that the church building projects meet all of the construction standards and all of the transparency about what happens to the funds that are being called for. That's some of the things that we're going to do in Haiti. You know, in most places where CRS works around the world, we are not, well, you may not know this, we are not the ones who actually do whatever has to be done. We support local institutions to do what has to be done. We try to build capability and support capability rather than have our engineers, our architects, our water and sanitation people do it. Supporting those partners is most, most important. You know, on the ground, local partners know what's going on in the communities and the villages. They know the people. They know the intrigues that are happening. So if we can support them, we'll be much more effective. In Haiti, as we work through local partners, we found that sometimes we had to become a little bit operational. We had to do a few things ourselves. We've pulled back now nine months into this effort and committed ourselves to build, however slow it's going to be, those capabilities that will be sustained and lasting. Because the handout after handout does not generate empowerment. And it does not increase the ability or the capacity, but it breeds a sense of dependence. And that's what we want to stop in Haiti. Let me just offer uh, a last example <clears throat> and talk a little bit about what we're doing in another area of health before Dennis talks about water. At that hospital, St. Francis de Sales, that I mentioned, in the aftermath of the earthquake, we set up those temporary facilities right amid the wreckage. I mean, there were, there were buildings that were still shaking over there while we were, we were treating pe uh, patients. And in recent weeks, we have had to move that entire hospital facility to a, a new site some distance away where we'll set up a temporary facility, uh, kind of a real tent hospital. Some of you can remember the TV program MASH, where these uh, military guys were out there in tents and they were treating people in the Korean War. It looks like that. But basically, our intent is over time to rebuild St. Francis de Sales Hospital and make it a network of 10 to 12 mostly Catholic hospitals associated with the University of Notre Dame of Hades Medical School and Nursing School. And all of the physicians that will come out of the University of Notre Dame's Medical School and Nursing School will be moved through these, this network of hospitals, both rural and urban. And after a generation, there will be a group of Haitian physicians that will have the highest standard of health training and capacity of any in the Western Hemisphere. That's our commitment, to leave something behind. And will St. Francis de Sales stand on its own right away? No. 
we and other partners will be working with them and that network for years to come. The goal will be to get the institution to take the steps it needs to stand on its own. That's a challenge. But that is the vision we see throughout our work in Haiti. We need the money going to Haiti to flow in a coordinated way. We need our partners there to be stronger so that we're not using our money just to hand out things to the poor, knowing that they will need more when those monies run out. So we're using some of our money to invest in training, building capacity in all different areas, be it health, be it small business development, be it agriculture, be it logistics and emergency response. In our housing programs, moving people from tents to more substantial temporary shelters, we had an option. We could hire a, a big construction firm out of Miami who was dying to come in and build 10,000 homes. You know, just deposit the money in Miami and bing bang, you're going to get some homes done. We said that's not the way we want to go. This is a Haitian issue. And we started street by street helping the people in that neighborhood come together to decide who actually owns that house. Because you may have heard that 60 to 70 people in Port a percent of the people in Port-au-Prince prior to the earthquake were either renters or squatting on land. They didn't own it. So when the buildings came down, whose house should we build? The guy who's living in Canada or in Philadelphia who owns the house that somebody else is living in? We couldn't figure that out. Only Haitians are going to figure that out. So we go slow, street by street, working with people to help them clear their own rubble, decide which houses should be built. No, Pierre really doesn't own that house. He says he does, but he's a liar. We all know it. The whole neighborhood knows it. Pierre doesn't own the house. So why should we rebuild it for him? Those are the kind of issues you have to deal with. We're working with the church, with Caritas Haiti, with others, to build again the capacity of Haiti, Haitians to lead the recovery process so that their lives are more dynamic, productive, and dignified. It's slower, yes. And I just got a, a question on TV last night. How much of the money that we gave you have you spent? As if spending money quickly is the best thing to do. Spending money smart is the best thing to do. I'm no Pollyanna about this. This is going to be a tough hill to climb. You should see Port-au-Prince. So much of it is still clogged with rubble nine months after the earthquake. The traffic's terrible. It takes an hour to get anywhere. The government, weak to begin with, almost destroyed by the earthquake, is now at a standstill as an election comes on us in another two weeks. The needs are immense. And just meeting them on a day-to-day -day basis occupies all of us 24-7, or even 36-10, when the storm comes in and the cholera epidemic overlays the recovery effort from the earthquake. But that's what we have to do if we're going to get it right. CRS has been in Haiti for 55 years, and we're proud of that. We've been with Haitians through thick and thin. We were there with them through the earthquake, and we're going to be with them throughout the entire recovery for years and years to come. Though we're going to get some criticism because we haven't spent all that money yet. But we're going to spend it smart. And we're going to have no problem seeing that Haitians are the drivers of future development. In my dream, if we get this right, is that in the future, we'll be playing a much smaller role in places like Haiti. We'll be supporting Haitians who are doing the work through their church and through their government. And maybe a couple of decades from now, we won't be there any longer.
because they won't need us. And that'll be done right. Thank you so very, very much. I'd like to now ask Dennis Warner to come up and talk a little bit about the water challenges in Haiti. water. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I could come up here and go through a litany of great successes that CRS has had in the water sector in Haiti. But as President Ken Hackett has shown, it is such a difficult problem that we're, we're struggling with our, with our own work, with our our efforts to engage the Haitians, uh, with our efforts to find proper strategies, proper approaches. And so it's, it's an ongoing process. Let me go through a little bit of background about what happened. The Haiti earthquake was a magnitude of 7.0 on the Richter scale. It, it happened, the epicenter of the earthquake was only 10 miles from Port-au-Prince. And Port-au-Prince is a capital of about <coughs> two and a half million people, who knows the amount, in a, in a country of nine million people. And with the metropolitan areas, probably the earthquake affected, <coughs> severely impacted half the population of Haiti. The extensive damage was a radius of at least 50 miles around the epicenter. Uh, as was mentioned, 230,000 people died. Can you imagine that? 300,000 were injured. At least that's the best statistics one has. And this, these statistics often are are very, very much guesstimates. Over two million people were displaced from their homes because their homes either collapsed, were severely damaged, or people were afraid to go back into the structures for fear that aftershocks would bring them down. And it turned out that Haiti was so densely populated that after the major event, the quake of, of uh, January 12th, little tiny informal, it's hard to say camps, but settlements of people occurred everywhere spontaneously in the city outside because people did not want to live or, or sleep inside their homes. So you had over a thousand informal little campsites everywhere. And, and the result of this earthquake was so devastating that almost everything stopped functioning. The government, the hospitals, the water systems, food distribution, Everything stopped functioning. And it barely functioned before the earthquake. Um, here's a map. <coughs> Oops. There we go. The epicenter was, was here. Haiti is, is like the big jaws of a reversed sea and the border with Dominican Republic is here. The epicenter was here. The capital of Port-au-Prince is here. And this is only a few miles apart. And so the, the capital was devastated by this event. And we've never seen such a disaster in a major urban area in modern times. Oops, what happened here? As I mentioned, many people were homeless, perhaps half the population of the city. People were sleeping everywhere. These camps arose. And, and in the main square, the central part of the city, where you have parades and statues, it, it, it happened to get a population of about 50,000 people just clustering there to get away from the devastation. Uh, there was no provision for services for these people for several days. They didn't have water. They didn't have food. They were terrified, and, and, and they were looking for some place of security. And it, when an earthquake happens, if you've ever been in one, it's one of the most terrifying feelings you can have because nothing is stable. Your whole world is, is shaking around you. 
CRS responded very quickly, within hours. But at the same time, the CRS office itself was badly damaged by the earthquake. We didn't lose any staff, but uh, it forced many CRS staff to sleep outside because they had no place to go either. And in the immediate days, actually <coughs> hours after the earthquake, CRS was able to br start bringing some relief. And this was from staff whose own houses had fallen down and may have lost some of their own family and loved ones. And so food, medical care, and water and sanitation were the immediate needs, the immediate things that CRS tried to address. And this was true of other organizations also. President Packett mentioned how the US military was very, very effective in coming in, helping with food distribution, and providing security. If you've ever seen food distribution in, in a crowd of 10,000 people who are hungry and starving, you can see you need security. You need someone to keep order. Uh, in time, CRS, as well as other organizations, began to give more attention to shelter, child protection, cash for work, these other elements of recovery. But again, I can't say these are great successes. They're things we worked at, we tried to do, and we're still trying to figure out how to do them better. Now, um, let me indicate some of the things that CRS tried to do on water. In that central area of the city where I said 50,000 people had clustered, the immediate need was sanitation. Where do they go to the toilet? Where do they deposit their own human excrement? And so the only solution we had, one couldn't build latrines there. It's concrete, and the space is very small. We had to bring in portable toilets. And for months, these portable toilets were there, getting cleaning services every day, very expensive. One of the worst things anybody in water and sanitation would like to do, but there was no alternative. So in emergencies, you go to the, the least worst alternative. The St. Francis de Sales Hospital was badly, badly damaged. The immediate needs were to try to get some of its systems running because in the immediate weeks and months, it was still needed to provide services. Since then, as was indicated, the, the hospital, uh, actually it's been bulldozed or it's being bulldozed. The functions were moved to a temporary site on the edges of the city, which was provided with uh, services water, sanitation, food distribution, and the, the tent city, the MASH approach. Uh, and uh, when the new hospital is built, it will shift back to that site. A major camp which arose was on a golf course, the Pietinville Club. And this was one of the great uh, common scenes in uh, Anderson Cooper's 360. Almost every night they would have a, a clip from the Pietinville Club. 50, 60,000 people were clustered there on the slopes of the golf course. CRS worked with organizing it and, and working with other partners who got involved and, and provided essential services. The problem with camps is they're not sustainable. They're only temporary and they don't solve long-term root causes. And as the months rolled, uh, unfolded, CRS began to provide assistance to a, a uh, number of these informal campsites that we found in various parts of the city. Some of them were quite large. The Accra camp was over 5,000 people. Some of them were much smaller, just a few hundred people. But we tried to work with those and a number of orphanages providing water, sanitation, hygiene services, uh, uh, promoting awareness of the need to, to change behaviors, child protection, and various other things. A couple of pictures just to give you a, a visual taste of what is happening. This is the Pietinville Golf Course Camp, and this is a drainage channel. Uh, when it rains, camps can be real muddy swamps, and you have to provide drainage for them. And, and uh, the Pietinville Camp is no excuse. When people are clustered in together, if you don't have drainage, Everything comes into the tents, and, and the people are in tents with several inches of water or more. Over time, if you're not maintaining these, these little drainage channels, they collect trash. It's like the city itself. The city is, is completely 
filled with rubble, trash, other things, some dating pre-earthquake, much of it dating post-earthquake. But it's, it's a problem of <coughs> things are not picked up, trash is not collected, people do not have places to dispose of their own bodily wastes. And so uh, if one isn't careful, the, the drainage canals become, become clogged. These are temporary showers. We call them showers, they're not really. They're, they're simply little enclosures where people take a bucket of water and pour it over their head, but we call them showers. And this is what most people in many poor countries view as a shower. And these are temporary, as you can see with the, with the plastic, until more permanent, more uh, suitable facilities can be developed. Latrines are a major thing. Where do people dispose of their own bodily wastes? And uh, we found that simply digging some holes, putting a little shelter around it, and letting people use them, they filled up immediately. And you can't empty them unless they're properly constructed because if you try to pump them out, the soils in the area are very sandy, that water table is high, and they just collapse. So one solu temporary solution leads to several more temporary problems. In this case, uh, you can see the latrine is being lined with, with concrete block. It's much more expensive, it's slower, but it's the only way you can have a facility that can be used continually. Hygiene is so important in any kind of a mass disaster and emergency. And in, in Haiti, it's, it's extremely important, especially with the cholera epidemic, which came on uh, just a, a month ago. Hand washing is one of the major issues of, of hygiene and health protection. In fact, many people in the health field will say hygiene or hand washing is the single most important thing you can promote in poor countries. CRS tried to promote hygiene and hygiene awareness. Uh, we, we engaged with a very good local artist to paint graffiti on latrine walls on other buildings to bring across the message to people, this is important, this is something they should do. Okay, what are the challenges that we're facing? And they're not unique to CRS, everybody's facing it. The UN system, the national development agencies like USAID, the other NGOs, and there are, there are dozens, hundreds of NGOs working there. One is this disaster happened in an urban area, and we don't know how to work in urban areas. We're used to having emergencies in rural areas <clears throat> where you have space, you can bring in your vehicles, you can move people to safer locations. In Haiti, that's not the case. And even trying to develop temporary locations outside of the city, temporary camps, was not, was not and is not successful because the landowners don't want to allow their land to be taken for this purpose. The people don't want to move out there. They're afraid to leave their damaged houses alone because they will be vandalized and they say there's no work out there. So what happens in other type of situations doesn't happen well here. The existing water and sewer system, well there essentially was none. The water system for the most part was tanker trucks which brought water in from the outside areas of the city, brought it to uh, private companies that would have a water tank and then they would sell the water to the people. And this system was badly uh, damaged because the trucks were, just, were, were damaged, the streets were clogged, the companies had uh, great casualties. There was no sewer system. People used a combination of <coughs> either <coughs> pit latrines or septic tanks or probably in most cases nothing at all. Port-au-Prince before the earthquake was not a very sanitary city and it's much worse now. The institution in that the government could provide only limited support. It's working, there is a, a functioning water agency, but they can only do so much. It's very limited. They work with, with a, a cluster of organizations on water, and, and they try to uh, address the most severe problems, but it's extremely difficult. Local contractors have suffered the same kind of damages to their systems as government. So there's, there's really very little places you can turn to. Even materials are in short supply. 
So uh, beyond that, the technical staff in Haiti are, are, some are very good, some are not so good. The good ones have pretty much been picked up and are working. It's, you don't go into the market and find good technical staff now. And the ones that have emigrated to other countries can't easily come back and work as many would like to do. And as I mentioned before, landowners are not always sympathetic to having camps on their land. They don't even want to have latrines on their soil, on their property, because they say, oh, th this will destroy the uh, aspect of their property in the future. Now, what are the additional challenges? Haiti has been hit by a triple whammy. It had the earthquake of January 12th. In the weeks following, it had several severe aftershocks. Some were in the Richter six point something category, and they provided more damage to what was already there. Uh, a month ago, in, in October, a cholera epidemic broke out. And uh, this has spread very rapidly because of uh, the unsanitary conditions in many of the crowded, especially the encampments. And over 500 people have died to date. And something like 7,000 have been hospitalized because of cholera. There's an unknown number that have not been hospitalized because people don't always have opportunities to get this care. So there's an attempt by the water sector agencies to double down on chlorination of water, hand washing, spraying and disinfection of surfaces like latrines and eating places, in, especially in the camps. Then Tropical Storm Tomas, or Hurricane Tomas, whichever you prefer, has just hit Haiti. And it's caused great, very great flooding in places. In places, it's had uh, rainfall totals between 5 and 10 inches. This has caused mudslides, flooding. Small camps have been washed away. Um, some of these camps, incidentally, were established on garbage dumps in the city because they were the only open places people could go. And CRS was trying to provide services to several camps which were on garbage dumps. Some 100,000 people uh, were said to be at risk for this tropical storm. Uh, and it's not clear how many have been severely affected by it, but, but uh, it, it has elicited a major response from the international community. Unfortunately, the, the problems and the devastation and the casualties still occurred. Okay, what are the next steps? This is for CRS. We are struggling with what strategy we should use. Ken Hackett has indicated how we're trying to reassess this and, and make our strategy such that it will lead to sustainable change. It's, it's easier, of course, to go in and do something than to help someone develop the capacity to do something. And, and in the devastation and the, the psychological trauma that has happened in, in Port-au-Prince, it's very hard to, to get people to want to uh, marshal their, their, their uh, strengths, their effort, their dedication to do things because they're tr coping with the, with the terrible losses they have had. Well, what right now we're in, uh, we're working on a transition package, trying to get people in the densely, uh, poorly serviced camps within Port-au-Prince to either move to some transition camps outside of Port-au-Prince, where somewhat better shelter, somewhat better water sanitation can be provided. Uh, uh, as one option. The other option is to work directly in those uh, urban campsites and try to rebuild where one can. But it's very difficult because of the dense crowding and the, the inability to bring in equipment, bring in uh, uh, things which will help both water, sanitation, hygiene, and, and do it in such a way that people want to do it and want to take charge and want to take ownership of the uh, of the activity. So the, the, there are some key issues here that we're struggling with very greatly. One is we feel sanitation is really the important thing right now, especially in Port-au-Prince. Water is important, no question about it.
But sanitation is, is the problem that, that it's the 80 pound, 800 pound gorilla in the China shop. And, and so we're spending a lot of our technical time looking at ways to deal with the handling of human excreta, the ways to improve solid waste management and collection, to work with the Haitian government, such as it is, to work with the Haitian agencies that are responsible for doing this and, and other NGOs that are interested in, in dealing with these issues. And they're not glamorous issues. It's no fun to go out to a garbage dump and to talk to people about washing their hands. It smells, it's dirty, you're happy when you can leave it. But you know you can leave it as, as an external person. And, and you say, how do these people manage to survive from day to day? Our long-term strategy, well, I've listed 2010 to 2014. That's not long-term. I think that's what we can think of in terms of trying to get some things done. But long-term, really, as was pointed out, decades. Haiti will be a high priority for CRS and for the world for decades to come. We would like to get to the point where we can ensure appropriate water and sanitation services to people. Uh, it's not going to happen in my lifetime and probably in your lifetime, but you need a goal. You need to have to say this is something that is worth working for. We, we need to help, help them understand and work to have a clean and sanitary environment. So you're not worried that your child is going to be touching things that have fecal matter on it, will get severe diarrhea, and maybe be serious, seriously ill or dead in a few days. And, and so we need to promote hygiene and good sanitation practices. This isn't, uh, this isn't engineering. It's sociology, it's, it's public awareness, it's communication, it's training. And, and all of these things come, come together. And so that, the, those are the major challenges facing us. And we hope that, uh, that coming here, that we will find partners to work with us. We, we need partners. We can't do it alone. We are working with many partners in the field. Uh, we have, we have uh, an opportunity to show that there are things that can be done together. Uh, the, the potential areas of importance here are studies, assessments, knowledge assessment and training, and, sta and, and staff development. A university is a very good institution to help us with that. Those are areas that we're not too strong in, at least in this sector. So with that, I will leave it and thank you for your good attention. Thank you, Dr. Hackett, for this speech. Um, it was a great insight into the problems facing Haiti today. Um, I was wondering what CRS will do in the upcoming years to promote uh, domestic support for the people in Haiti. I know the transition from uh, international relief to Haitians um, being, I guess, self uh, able to support themselves is going to be a long process. How will uh, CRS and what's the domestic support in order to help patients realize these goals. Thank you. Um, it's nice to get a question from, no? Uh, uh, John? Yeah. It's nice to get a question from somebody from the Red Sox Nation. Uh, <laughs> the, the challenge is going to be to, to keep uh, America's eye on that ball. Um, and we have a tendency to look elsewhere. And I think that involves our Congress, with the new Congress coming in, to see if we can get them focused on issues of supporting trade in Haiti uh, and opportunities for investment, however marginal they may be, uh, and to stay with it over the long term. And then uh, there'll be the one year anniversary of, uh, of the earthquake coming up in, in January, and we'll try to, to um, bring it forward in, in identifying the positive 
elements that are there, and at the same time what needs to be done, and at the same time um, what Haitians are doing. So it, we'll use any and all opportunities to keep the issue alive. Yes. Uh, President Hackett, uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on what kind of interactions you've had with the uh, government of Haiti. I'm thinking about your plan for the hospital and the 10-year program, and it sounds infinitely reasonable. And then I see these, this constant supply of money coming in, and I'm thinking, what are the local politicians and the national politicians going to be doing? Are they going to be putting any barriers in your way, like you got to use these people or you have to buy from that contractor? How's that going to impact your operation? Oh, very, very good question. Actually, the, the health plan in its nucleus was developed with the Minister of Health in November of uh, last year, a year ago, before the earthquake, where the minister said, my medical school of the Ministry of Health doesn't work. The doctors are on strike and it just doesn't work. University of Notre Dame's medical school has the potential to work better. So we struck that relationship around one hospital, St. Francis de Sales. That has now expanded even further. And then we're now in dialogue with uh, Paul Farmer and his group up in Boston who are doing some other development of health, ca health capability in the north. So if we can match those two things, we hope we'll, we'll find some success. There, there's an election coming up. There will be a new minister of health. It remains to be seen how we're going to work with them. We don't channel our money, our money, through government uh, sources. Um, there have been the development of some structures that uh, President Clinton has supported setting up. It remains to be seen whether they're going to work on it. Um, uh, my question is, as students, um, like college students, is the only thing that we can really do about this cause to become educated about it and to give money to it? Or is there something else that you think college students should be engaged in? Well, I, I think there have been some brilliant examples of college students shaking um, the walls in Washington, um, talking to your elected representatives, uh, keeping their eye on the ball on this issue, uh, and, and many other issues. Um, quite frankly, and you, you probably picked it up from my thing, I don't think rushing on to Haiti to help build the school is going to solve the problem. Make, it'll make you feel great. Um, and it may be even a transformative experience, so I, I wouldn't dismiss it completely. But that's not the answer. The answer is sustained focus and support to Haitian institutions as they develop. Could I just add to that, I think part of it is tapping the enthusiasm, the energy, and the, and the commitment of, of students to trying to bring change. Each generation has this, this mandate to improve on what their elders have done or not done. I've noticed in the engineering students have some special day next week uh, on Water Day to raise awareness both among themselves and in the general public. So students, through the knowledge they get from their studies, have a great opportunity and I would say responsibility to make others beyond their immediate circle aware of what is happening and what can be done. try to answer that just in the Haiti context because it would it would be too too much to go further around the world. There has been a, a, a high level of collaboration and I'll ask Dennis to talk about the UN cluster system and how that actually works uh, or does not work. But, but basically uh, first for us 
there was a collaboration with Catholic agencies. We tried to respond to, respond to Haiti as one church, not five different offices of the Catholic Church in the United States, but one church. And then we expanded from that to various religious communities. I addressed the group of men religious, that's Jesuits, Augustinians, Oblates, etc., at their meeting to see if we could find a way that we could actually talk to each other and collaborate. So the Jesuits weren't building the school over there and the Augustinians building another one right here without talking to each other. That kind of thing exists in Haiti. So there is an intentionality in the collaboration among the Catholic agencies. And then it goes further to, we just subcontracted for housing to Habitat for Humanity, and I think the Adventist. Habitat's gonna build, we're gonna give them money to build a thousand homes. Uh, the Adventist, I don't know what it is, 800. And Care and Save the Children. Oxfam built some of the sanitation um, facilities in some of the camps. So that actually happens in a, in a deliberate way. It does not happen as well when the group from wherever runs down there for the weekend and tries to do their own thing. We don't know they're there. We don't know what support they need. They don't know we're there and what capacity we have. We have 500 people there. So we're working on it. Beyond CRS, there's, there is a, a major collaborative effort at the, the international level headed up by the United Nations. They've, they've developed a process called the cluster system in each of the sectors. So in the water sector, when an emergency occurs, organizations which have already been talking with each other are, are expected and hope to come together under the leadership of some pre-designated agency, which, may, which usually is a UN agency, it might be UNICEF, it might be a World Food Program, and they would work together as a cluster to coordinate their efforts and avoid duplication. The, the weakness in this system is that it requires voluntary participation by the organizations, which is very difficult. But the strength is, if it can be done, and if organizations will make themselves a bit vulnerable to working with others, one can achieve far more effective results and quicker results. This, this cluster system is still very new. It really arose out of the massive international effort that, that was poured into uh, Aceh, Indonesia, and the other areas affected by the Asian tsunami of Christmas 2004. So I think we had the child protection cluster about the trafficking of children and things like that. We have some skill in that, and uh, I think we're the head of that. We have time for two questions. I believe you have the microphone and someone back here. Um, this question is for President Hackett. Uh, you talked about the American conception of aid and the role that you know, media has in um, countries, especially in cases following disaster. How does CRS fight this conception, and then how can you, back in the States, fight this conception as well? Um, a very good question. Uh, I don't think we've been very successful in overcoming some of the negative trends that, that we see from uh, some of the media who just want to get out there and get the story, particularly the negative story and not the positive story. Um, we are at it continually, um, but I cannot claim any success as yet. I, again, I'll go back to Dennis's point about what you can do on campus. I know that the students from Cabrini are gonna put out some kind of a program I'm sure here at uh, uh, Villanova, you, you could put out some program or, or have debates and discussions. Um, a, a young woman talked about a program you had in, in Nicaragua. Maybe you could put the same energy into inviting some of the media people from the area and, and find out about what's going on in, in Haiti. Uh, we'd be happy to help you on that. Hi, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, my question is concerning what you said before about uh, how what's going to happen once all the first world doctors leave and um, they're left with uh, the actual doctors from Haiti. But I think that the problem stems not only from within medicine, but also to agriculture and all other aspects of the economy. Um, my question for you is, is there anything that the CRS is doing or other like global philanthropic organizations 
to sort of combat that, or do you think that that is just a necessary evil that something that's going to play global philanthropy for years to come? Uh, I'm not sure I actually understand the problem, but the fact that the there is a rush of talent from first world countries in for a short period of time, and then it leaves, whether it be talent in health or talent in construction or something else, that, that's just the reality. What, what we are attempting to do is to support the local institutions in the health program, in, in the water engineers, so that they don't leave. And in that example I gave you about the church reconstruction entity, we hope to hire Haitian architects, Haitian engineers, and give them a good salary and, and make sure that they have a good opportunity to raise their family in a good uh, program to do something substantive that gives them dignity and professionalism. So that's what we're trying to do. You know, there's uh, one last person estimate who is from Haiti. <laughs> um, my question is already answered, so I just want to take this opportunity to say a great thank you to you on behalf of my people. And we're very grateful for what we are doing. And please keep doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you very much. today, I just wanted to make an announcement that Water for Wasala is having Water Awareness Day on Wednesday, um, this Wednesday, and we are signing Water for the World Act um, letters to send to our congressmen. We are also having a solidarity tank, which basically, if you can sign up to pledge to participate in the solidarity tank and only get your water source for the entire day from a communal source at the Oreo, um, so it's a mindful inconvenience to you to kind of be in solidarity with those who do have to walk miles and miles to get a clean water source. Um, there are also other events, so we have representatives from our group here tonight. If you have any questions or you're interested, um, you can come and speak to one of us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.